There's a lot of hype around Microsoft's .NET Aspire, and I was asked my opinion on it, but I don't really have one because I haven't really looked into it, nor have I used it. So follow along as I dig a little bit deeper and kind of give my first impressions. Hey, what's up? It's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. And while I'm aware of Aspire, I haven't really read anything or watched a video about it, nothing. So this is kind of all fresh to me. What I have seen from like little tweets from David Fowler, since he's always tweeting about it, is my first impression without knowing anything about it is I think of it as a in-code version in .NET, a C-sharp, of using a Docker Compose with some type of service discovery or something where you can automatically connect things easily, like connection strings, etc. So we'll see if I'm actually right on that or not. So I'm gonna dig into their sample code, look at some of the docs and kind of just give my impressions. And I'd love for you to comment along the way if I'm way off base here or give some nuance and some extra me details about, about things that I might be glossing over. Before I jump into my first look and first impression, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So if you're unfamiliar with it, like I am but aware of it, it's a new stack for streamlining development of .NET cloud native services. It is now generally available. I always love the term cloud native. Cloud native, really what you're talking about probably here is a distributed application. Oh, then that's what actually it says here, distributed application. And I think that's more the gist than any of this is having connected components. Never mind the cloud aspect of that. Even if you had anything you're running on wherever it is on-prem, you still have different resources like your database and all that stuff that even for local development, Docker was really helpful for. So we got developer dashboard, which I've seen screenshots of, orchestration, which is what I believe the Docker Compose encode version is, service discovery, which is using that orchestration, and deployment, I'm not really super familiar with. So they do have sample apps, so I'm gonna jump into that. So I pulled down the Aspire Shop sample application, and I actually, I wasn't sure if this was based on like eShop on web or something like that, but the first thing I noticed that, that was different was there's this app host project and the service defaults, which I'll jump into in a second. But when I got in here, I noticed, oh, well, there's really only two things, well, really one, which is the, the program CS. And this is where I've seen somewhat screenshots before of, where really this feels like the Docker Compose and code that I was referencing. So kind of the idea here that we have this builder, this distributed application, thankfully it's called that and not cloud native something, but we have where we're using this builder where we're adding Postgres or giving it a name, some other type of optional parameters. I'm, I'm assuming that are kind of all built on this component that we're using here, this resource builder. So I see that we can, you know what I mean? Like you can add data volume, you can kind of do all that configuration of what that dependency is, like that component. So that makes sense. Same type of thing with Redis. Each one of these, I think, is probably what they're defining as components. So, for example, if you are um, anything, Redis, Event Store, Postgres, MySQL, um, any other type of cache, memcache, like anything, that there's probably components and builders for these to define all the configuration for them. As well as your own .NET projects, which I noticed in here. So you can say basically that there's this catalog, catalog service, um, and it has a reference to the catalog DB. And this is what I found very interesting is probably within those references, that gets your ability to then reference like from within the catalog service and be able to reuse that resource. And that's where the service discovery, I'm assuming, comes into play. Same way as the rest of this here, we're saying that the basket service has a reference to the basket cache, um, our front end, has the basket service, the catalog service uh, with external HTTP uh, endpoints, et cetera. So this kind of feels very interesting to me of being able to kind of define all the, the external resources that you need for your app and define it in one place. A couple quick thoughts. Is it cool that you can do this in code as opposed to a Docker Compose? Sure, I'm about to run out and change existing projects that are fairly simple that maybe just have a couple services in a Docker Compose. Probably not. Starting something fresh, maybe I'd consider this. Now for service discovery, specifically with local development, this is not really a concern for me since you really kind of know everything ahead of time. 
It just really isn't an issue. But now in production, if you don't have something behind a load balancer, you don't specifically know what that name is, then sure that's useful because oftentimes you're really just using DNS and round robin and things are kind of going in and out of registration behind whatever instances are coming up when you're scaling out. So service discovery in a production environment, useful. Local development, not so much. But out of curiosity, just curious how the service discovery works because I'm basing it, it's all by this name. So we're giving everything a name. So like if I look at basket cache, which is Redis, and I know basket cache is used in our basket service, I'm just out of curiosity gonna search for this. And yeah, I can see in the basket service, we are adding our Redis to the client and then our connection name, I'm assuming is how this is all wired up is just by that name. So again, we don't really have to think about where the location is, IP, host names, ports, etc. This is just all wiring it up for us. So one of the other things I noticed was this service defaults project, which I really had no idea what it was. And I can see it has um, add service defaults, um, configure open telemetry, this is all using. So my guess here is we have this set up in this sample. Um, yeah, so our basket service is adding all these things for open telemetry. Um, what else do we got in here? Yeah. All our base level projects that are actually gonna execute are running these. So they're gonna be all doing the exact same thing. So open telemetry, health checks, service discovery, which I mentioned, which is probably required to run. Um, configuring our HTTP client defaults, that's interesting. So we're doing our baseline resilience. It also needs to do the service discovery. So that's interesting. So we just have this kind of extension method so that each one of our actual executable running processes here, the basket service, catalog service, front end, are all leveraging that. So in terms of orchestration, if you have a single solution, even if it's just one .NET project, that's your executable, but then other ex external dependencies like a cache database, this actually makes a lot of sense. Just even from this base level, I can see there's open telemetry and other stuff going on. I know there's the dashboard, but even from just this baseline of this, if I was starting a new project, I'm kind of seeing the value here. So I was gonna run the sample app and then the first thing I had to think of was, well, what am I actually running? So there's the app host, which kind of makes sense because everything's wiring up. But my first thought was, well, I might actually in Rider have different multiple .NET projects that are all referenced in here. And then I'd probably end up creating some type of compound um, execution where I can say, okay, well, these are all the things that I want to run. But that doesn't actually make sense. It only makes sense really to be running the app host because obviously it's the one making sure all our services are running, externals, doing all that wiring up with our service discovery. So ultimately, yeah, it's just the app host that we're running. But that kind of is a little bit of a weird situation for you. If you don't necessarily want to be running everything, maybe you can then have multiple different app hosts or depending on environment variables, only want certain things to run. So if you have different complex scenarios, you might not want all of this to run all the time. So after running the app host, here's the dashboard that you come up with. You can see all the projects that you're running, all those dependencies are ultimately containers. You can view the logs of the container, which is helpful, I guess, instead of running somewhere else in some other app, but we're coming here. <laughs> I don't know. I guess you kind of have a combination of viewing the console logs or whatever logs are being generated from your project and container, I guess, in one uniform place. There's value there. Is it life-changing to me? I don't know, I haven't been using this in production. If you have, let me know in the comments if this has been kind of earth shattering to you. The other part of this, same type of thing, because I'm assuming that all these are connected to being exported in the same spot. You have all your traces, you distributed uh, tracing with open telemetry and metrics. So it's all in one spot, useful. In the look, again, I keep thinking about local development here. I could see maybe in production environments this is a heck of a lot more helpful. So let's kind of explore that a little bit more on the deployment side. So when I did some quick searching, I came up with how to deal with deployments. And I guess the gist is ultimately it outputs a manifest file that's really describing basically all the services, everything that's gonna be deployed in the app host project. So from there, it looks like obviously Azure, <laughs> which makes sense, and Azure container apps. Um, if you're using Kubernetes, there is a separate project called Aspirate, which is basically doing the conversion from the uh, Aspire JSON manifest to your Kubernetes uh, YAML manifest. So there's that conversion. I'm curious of what the AWS solution to this. 
obviously not Kubernetes, but something like maybe like ECS. How is it generating your different services or your task files, et cetera? Or maybe you're using cloud formation. So with all of that, the question then becomes, what happens if not everything is defined within your app host? So that's a little bit of my question is, as an example, let's say I have my app. Locally, I'm going to configure my app host to be using Redis as my cache. But maybe I'm using AWS and I'm not using Redis. I'm using their memory DB, which is Redis compatible. And that's already existing in production environment. How does all that work between maybe this mix match of what I have locally and what I'm using in my app host locally? And that differs from what I'm actually using in production. That's a question for you. Let me know in the comments. I can see why people in the .NET space are excited about Aspire, especially for local development. Ease of onboarding, just run it, you're good. You don't have to think about running a separate Docker Compose. The production part of it, I'm still lost. I don't really see, I feel like that could be very complicated. But for local development, sure, I can see the value there. Is it that much easier than running a Docker Compose? Sure, it can be easier than running a Docker Compose. It's not like, hey, pull this down, run the Docker Compose, or whatever the case may be. You just have to run the app host. So it does make it marginally easier. So there's value, I get it. For me personally, and thinking about my context, I, I'm not really sure I find it that useful to have to switch anything I existing have, but I'd love to know kind of your experience so far in the comments, how you've been using it, have you been deploying, using it for deployments? Let me know in the comments, I'd love to hear from you. And if you wanna chat with other software developers about topics like this and software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server, where ultimately this is where this video came from. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.